So hello everyone and welcome to today's ACM learning webinar. So this webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and servicing, uh, serving, sorry, the other, starting that again. <laughs> so this webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and serving the over 97,000 computing professionals and students who are ACM's member. I'm Philippe Baudouin, one of the co-founders of Element AI. Uh, we're a company doing AI for uh, industry. We're working with a lot of large customers out there building custom solutions. Um, and I currently lead the Applied and Fundamental Research Groups here. You can find more information on my background in the video widgets that you should see on your screen right now. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with ACM or what it has to offer, here's a bit more information. ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members can stay competitive in the constantly changing world of computing with a range of ACM Learning Center resources at learning.acm.org. Sorry. So you can see some of the highlights on your screen. ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. It provides timely computing information published by ACM, including communication of the ACM and Q magazines, access to the ACM Digital Library, the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature, international conferences that draw leading experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics, and support for education and research, including curriculum development, teacher training, and the ACM Turing and ACM Prize in Computing Awards. ACM enables its members to solve critical problems using new technology that enriches our lives and enhances society and the digital age. So before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping attempts shown in the slide in front of you. First, the slides will advance thematically throughout the event. You can download the deck from the resources window on your screen. On the bottom panel, you will find a number of additional widgets and resources. If you are experiencing problems with the slides or audio, press the F5 key on Windows or comment R if you're on Mac, or refresh your browser on a mobile device. You can also close and relaunch the presentation. <coughs> To control the volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. And if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A box at any time during the webinar and click the Submit button. Um, I personally organize questions as Negar speaks, and she'll reserve time at the end of the presentation to address them. This session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. And you can check learning.acm.org for updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. At the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey open on your screen. Please take a minute to fill it out to help us improve our webinars. And you may also open the link to the survey at any time from the resource window on your screen. So you can also use the Facebook and Twitter widgets in your button panel to share the presentation link with your friends, as well as tweet comments and questions during the ash using the hashtag um, ACM Learning. We'll be watching for your tweets. We also have a new community discourse page to continue the discussion after this webcast, including questions we won't be able to answer uh, during the Q&A session. So today's presentation is hierarchical adversarially learned inference, and it will be given by uh, my friend here, Negar Rostamzadeh. I've been practicing this. <laughs> so Negar is a research scientist here at Element AI, and her areas of interest are machine learning and particularly deep learning approaches uh, used on machine, uh, multi, sorry, multimedia problems. She's been working mainly in video understanding. Negar received her bachelor's degree in computer science from the University of Tehran. She spent more than two years of her PhD here in Montreal at the University of Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithm Lab, or MILA. 
She worked under the supervision of Professor Aaron Corville, and she finished her PhD there in April 2017. Negar co-founded the Women in Deep Learning workshop in 2016 and has organized several workshops in 2017, including Women in Machine Learning at the NIPS conference, Women in Computers Vision at CDPR, and Women in Deep Learning at the Mila Deep Learning Summer School. So without further ado, Negar, take it away. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to be presenting a recently submitted work to the OITLIR conference titled as HALI, uh, which is standing for Hierarchically Adversarially Learned Inference. This work is led by Ishmael Belghazi and supervised by Aaron Corbeil, and is a joint work with uh, Sai Rajeshwar, Olivier Master Pietro, and Giovanna Mitrovic. Uh, how is about the reconstruction? So I'll start briefly talking about the reconstruction, inference, uh, and variational autoencoder. Then we will see how the problem can be tackled without an inference mechanism and an adversarial setup. We will briefly see uh, what's, a, uh, what's the generative adversarial networks. Then I will be continuing with ALI, which stands for Adversarial Learned Inference. ALI is um, Deep Directed generated, uh, generated Models. It jointly learns an inference network using an adversarial process. An important property of ALI is that it doesn't have explicit reconstruction loop in its objective function. So it's not actually concentrated on making pixel perfect reconstructions, but learn to capture very interesting semantic information. So using ALI, it's feasible to capture variations of the samples. And I will be showing you in this section how Ali is capturing this information and learn to explore different variations of input samples. Uh, however, um, reconstruct uh, reconstructed images using Ali are not perfect. In Hali, we try to address the source of the discrepancy between the data samples and their Hali, uh, their Ali uh, reconstructions. Can it be because of the failure of the adversarial training, or is it because of the challenges that are coming from uh, compressing the information from the data into a smaller and very restrictive um, latent space. In this paper, we explore issues surrounding the representation of complex, rich structured data, such as natural images. HAL is indeed the hierarchical extension of ALI. And it indeed is a hierarchical generative model with a simple Markovian structure and a correspondent inference model. The same as Ali, both the generative and inference models are trained using the adversarial learning paradigm. Then in the results section, uh, we show that within a purely adversarial training paradigm and by exploring uh, the model's hierarchical structure, we can modulate the perceptual fidelity of the reconstructions. Finally, we present the usefulness of the learner presentation on a semi-supervised task and also uh, um, on, on an unsupervised task as well. So let's talk about autoencoders. An autoencoder is a neural network which is consists of an encoder and a decoder. It takes the input data X, uh, which may be very complicated, such as being a natural image, takes it into the latent space, and then reconstruct it. Reconstruction is a two-step process, an act of compression and abstraction, which is the encoding, followed by an act of description, which is indeed a decoding. And an autoencoder is trained to try reconstructing the input X to its output R. The hidden layer is basically the code to represent the input. So the encoder is the function that takes the input X into a latent space, Z. And then the decoder gets the latent representation, Z, as input and reconstruct X, um, X as R. Uh, Z can have smaller dimension and simpler representation than X. In this kind of cases, we call it under-complete autoencoder. Uh, and for example, the encoder can be viewed as an approach for dimension reduction. Now, if uh, an autoencoder simply learns to copy exactly the same input X everywhere um, during the reconstruction, it won't be a useful network. Instead, we want to restrict it to learn just useful information. 
uh, and an imperfect approximation of the input. So basically, the idea is to make the encoder learns a code which resembles the most important part of the training data or its input. If there is no linearity, no activation function, and there is only one hidden layer, and the loss is mean square error, the model learns to span um, uh, the model learns to span the same sort of space as PCA. Autoencoders with nonlinear encoder and nonlinear decoder or deep hidden layers can learn more powerful generalization of PCA. Then again, another issue can arise. Uh, if the network has a very high capacity, it can just learn to copy the training data without learning something useful about the data set. So what are we going to do? So we need to find a hidden layer dimension and the right capacity for the encoder and the decoder regarding to the complexity of the distribution uh, to be modeled. Regularized autoencoders basically are supposed to do this. Instead of decreasing the capacity of the encoder and decoder or uh, making a shallow representation, uh, regularization can help avoiding copying. So it helps us learning useful representation of the data distribution. These properties can include robustness to noise, smallness of the derivatives of the representation, and sparsity of the representation. Several regularization schemes uh, have been used in the literature, the most well-known being the denoising and contractive autoencoders. Denoising autoencoders try to reconstruct corrupted data, typically with a Gaussian or salt and uh, pepper noise. Contractive uh, autoencoders penalize the Jacobian of their constructions uh, with the input. Uh, regularized autoencoders uh, tend to learn useful information about the input data despite of having encoder and decoder with great capacity or deep latent representations. Any generative, um, any generative model with latent variables and an inference procedure to compute the latent representations given the input can be viewed as a form of regularized autoencoder. One of such model is variational autoencoder. These models are trained to approximate the training data rather than just copying the input to its output. So as you see in this formula, the base formula, uh, we want to compute the posterior uh, p of z given x. Computing the p of x would be, in some cases, intractable. Uh, one way would be uh, to find another distribution q to approximate the inference q of z given x. Variational autoencoder is, maximi uh, is minimizing the distance between these distributions using variational inference. And in our head, uh, we will be exploring two approaches to find Q of Z given X, uh, which is variational and adversarial. So we are interested in reconstructing X with respect to some distribution Z of some uh, desirable properties as you can see here. So we took the log of x to the left side and log of p of x and z to the right side and multiply both sides by a negative sign. So that we can express p of x in terms of the probabilities uh, that involve z. Then this equation is achieved by adding minus log of q of z given x and the idea is uh, defining a distribution Q of Z over the latent space of Z that you identify its characteristic and employ it to generate P of X with it. Then we can, um, then we can obtain this, question, um, this equation, uh, which the left side is independent to Z, and the right side is obtained by uh, integrating over Z uh, with respect to Q of Z given X. Uh, the k term is hard to compute, uh, given intractability of the integral uh, over the p distribution. However, the fact that the KL term is non-negative, making the expectation term, which is the first term, a lower bound for log of p of x. Then here we just uh, replace p of, um, uh, p of x and z uh, as p of x given z multiplied by p of z, which is shown in the equation. Then the last equation is computed by co uh, considering the fact that log of p of x given z multiplied by p of z is equal to log of p of x given z uh, plus uh, log of p of z. This is actually defining an objective function. 
that we want to maximize in order to maximize log of p of x for generating x. The KL term has a negative sign, so it has to be minimized, and that implies Q has to have a distribution like P. So according to the KL term, the distribution of Z given by Q should match another distribution, P. This is achieved via uh, training the encoder, and we can choose the, um, the type of distribution as a simple distribution like Gaussian. The first part of the objective function is in conceptually the reconstruction, uh, re reconstruction success which will be maximized by training the neural network uh, of the decoder. Uh, P of x given z, sorry. P of, P of x uh, given z when reconstruction is achieved via the decoder from z, being totally deterministic uh, via the train network when z is given is equivalent of P of g, um, x uh, given z. After all, the first term would be some function of x minus the reconstruction, and maximizing the log likelihood will be equivalent to minimizing the reconstruction error in the variational autoencoder setup. Now, now we have seen the variational inference and variational autoencoder. Uh, let's check GAN. In GAN, uh, there is no need for inference during the training. The network of GANs can be made intuitive by adopting a game, uh, game theory angle. GANs consist of two neural networks, a generator and a discriminator, which are playing a game against each other. The discriminator D in the middle gets a sample X. It doesn't know that this X is coming from the true data distribution, Q of X, or is from the generator. The generator generates samples from P of X given Z, and Z is sampled from a fixed distribution. The task of the discriminator is to understand which sample is coming from the data and which sample is fake and is coming from the generator. The task of the generator is also to fool the discriminator. Since there is no connection between the data which is coming from the generator and the data which is coming from the discriminator, there is no need to have an inference. The adversary again played between the discriminator and the generator is formalized uh, by the formula that I'm showing you in this page. Um, in one hand, the discriminator maximizes um, the probability of correctly classified data samples and the, generate, um, the generated samples. On the other hand, uh, the, um, the generator is trained to create samples as close as possible to the real data to be able to fool the discriminator. Uh, it can also be shown that for a fixed generator, the optimal discriminator is Q of X divided by the summation over Q of X and P of X. Uh, and that given an optimal discriminator, minimizing the value function with respect to the generator parameters is equivalent to minimizing the Jensen Shannon divergence between P of X and the Q of X. Uh, in other words, uh, as training progresses, the generator generates samples that look more and more like the original data samples. So, as we've seen so far, VAE was trying to improve the quality and efficiency of the inference by learning the inference mechanism and GAN by past the inference. Autoregressive approaches, uh, which we are not uh, going to explore in this talk, go without latent representations and instead model the relationship between input variables directly. While all techniques are consistent given infinite capacity and the data, uh, in practice, they learn very different kinds of generative models on typical data sets. As we have seen, VAE uses an approximate inference mechanism that allows the reuse of uh, various auxiliary tasks, uh, which could be really interesting, and we are also interested in them, such as semi-supervised learning or in painting. But a disadvantage of VAE is that because of the injected noise and imperfect reconstruction and with the standard decoder with factorized output distribution, the generated, uh, the generated samples are usually blurry compared to the ones coming from GAN. V is basically optimized uh, likelihood, and maximizing likelihood yields an estimated dens uh, density that allows uh, um, to bleed probability mass away from the estimated data manifolds. Uh, GANs, however, can have a sharper estimation of the density function, even if it does not perfectly coincide with the data density. Even though GANs are 
pretty good at generating non polarity realistic synthetic samples, they lack the ability to do the efficient inference, or basically inference. They actually do need the inference sometimes and for some tasks. Now I'm going to uh, talk about Ali adversarial and inference. Uh, there's another paper, uh, I will actually showing it to you. There's also uh, another paper called adversarial feature, adversarial feature learning, which is uh, released at the same time with Ali and with a very similar idea. So Ali can be considered as the augmented version of GAN, uh, which has the inference. Ali is indeed a deep directed generated model and cast the learning of both inference model and the generate, generator model in an adversarial framework. In Ali, uh, in Ali basically, uh, on learn VA, the objective function involves no explicit reconstruction loop. Here's a simple GAN like illustration of Ali. Uh, Ali also modifies the discriminator's objective. Instead of examining if uh, the data is coming from the sample distribution or fake distribution, uh, it now receives the joint pair of X and Z as input and must predict whether they're coming from the encoder joint or the decoder joint. Uh, like before, the generator is trained to fool the discriminator, but this time, instead of learning to generate samples similar to the one coming from the data distribution, it can also learn Q of Z given X. The adversary game played between the discriminator and the generator is formalized uh, by the given value function, uh, which is um, as formula 2. Uh, in the same analogy of GAN, we can also show that for a fixed generator, the optimal discriminator is Q of X and Z over the summation uh, of Q, uh, Q, um, Q of X and Z and P of X and Z. And that given an optimal discriminator minimizing the value function with respect to the generator parameters is equivalent to minimizing the gen sunshine and divergence between P of X and Z and Q of X and Z. And matching the joint, um, and the joints also had the effect of matching the marginals, basically. So now let's uh, check some results coming from Ali. Um, here is the uh, in the left side, uh, there are the generated samples on tiny ImageNet. There are some pictures which capture the texture well, and there are some generated images which are nice looking. The right side is the reconstructions, uh, which the odd columns uh, representing the original images and the columns beside them are the reconstructions. For the reconstruction, uh, we are putting the samples from the validation set uh, through the encoder and getting the Z, uh, which is the output of the encoder network, and then feed it to the decoder. Uh, in VAE, uh, Z is shared, but in Ali, uh, the Z are not shared. Uh, so. It's a training process that induces the uh, correspondence. Uh, it is tiny uh, image in a data set, having many number of concepts with respect to the number of samples, Ali underfits the data and only uh, some lower level concepts such as general orientation or shapes uh, that are captured during the reconstruction. Uh, for the SVHN, uh, we see that some of the reconstructions are showing different numbers compared to the input, which are shown, uh, like here, I actually pointed them by red color, red bonding box around them. That's because the encoder and the decoder are different models, and the Z is not shared, so that the input corresponds to, this, uh, to Z uh, in encoder um, um, uh, because of the underfitting similar to uh, what is happening in GAN sometimes, uh, the same Z may generate a sample without necessarily representing the same concept. Which here you can see like the two, uh, which is reconstructed as nine, and uh, five, which is reconstructed as eight, uh, and so on. Uh, so now let's check the CIFAR result. A uh, result of the reconstruction and sample on CIFAR looks interesting. There are uh, some of them are still off uh, due to underfitting, uh, but there are some of the concepts that are well captured, like a blue truck, uh, which I actually uh, made um, a red block around that, uh, which is reconstructed to a red truck uh, with the same point of view, and it's within a, um, and it's very interesting because uh, like um, it's 
understood that okay, so the, it should generate, it should reconstruct into a truck, but then like uh, with a different color, but also the same orientation. Uh, so now let's actually check also um, the result of syllabi. So VA is usually uh, produce blurry images, uh, but Adi uh, generates like sharper images. The latent space of faces are matching with respect to various features, including hair color, hair uh, color, gender, age, um, um, and higher level concepts. Some relevant features like having eye wears is not captured in some of the cases, uh, which uh, I actually put uh, a red bonding box around them. But the, um, um, and some, some of them actually also um, capture some irrelevant features of the image, such as background color, uh, which uh, I put a green bonding box around it. Unlike other adversarial approaches like this again, Ali allows uh, what to interpolate between actual data points. So even two samples x1 and x2 to the encoder, which is actually like imagine x1 as uh, the left column and x2 as the um, right column, the encoder uh, and getting the correspondence z1 and z2, now we can, we can smoothly move from z1 to z2 as uh, input um, to the decoder walking along uh, some conceptual variations and generate samples that correspond to such changes in the corresponding concepts. Now, as you see from left to right in the first row, the man is turned to a woman, and in the second row, uh, the hat is removed and the hair color is changing uh, from bl uh, blonde to black. Again, in the row three and four, you see the interpolation along the way. Here is also the result of, uh, the result of the semi supervised learning using Ali uh, on the SVHN data set. Uh, given a validation sample to the encoder as X of validation and looking at its correspondent uh, Z of validation, then looking at the nearest Z uh, values from the training set, uh, which is labeled, uh, we could apply inference, uh, which leads to high performance on SVHN. For example, as it's presented uh, in the table, you can see like the result. Um, the misclassification rate, uh, rate is even less than GAN. As also compared with like other approaches, uh, which is DC. Um, yeah. And the GAN, uh, which is here, is basically uh, the GAN from Solomon uh, in 2016, uh, and uh, using the feature matching the established GAN. Um, some, uh, somehow they claim that they established GAN. Uh, so in this table, uh, which uh, is on the CIFAR 10 data set, um, I'm exploring the number of label examples in the semi-supervised learning setup. Here they follow the same setup with the Solomon et al. Uh, feature matching work. The result is very similar and even slightly better in some cases with the results. But uh, what's interesting to notice is that Ali achieves um, this widow feature matching, which is the uh, feature matching paper is explained to add stability to the GAN, uh, the same as like the results from the uh, last frame. So it's also important to note that uh, more labeled sample employed among the training set, the manifolds are associated with more fine-grained concepts and hence the performance improved which is actually uh, the reason for that experiment. So, no condition of generation. Uh, here's the condition of generation. The latent uh, space Z along, the, along uh, certain directions could encode concepts that are introduced with the data when the data set is rich with respect to those concepts. When we consider latent space that uh, are at the intersection of some of such concepts, the generated results will include such concepts. So for example, in this image, you can see actually um, uh, adding, like changing the hair colors, like uh, um, conditioning, on, uh, conditioning on having um, the different hair color or um, conditioning on having glasses or hat, like uh, the first images in um, the column I uh, uh, is uh, conditioned on like having hat and having glasses. And uh, there are some of the pictures which are conditioned on some other uh, thing. So um, you can see actually the name of uh, like uh, the features and the attributes which um, each of uh, these columns are conditioned on in the picture. So 
solo uh, hierarchical adversary learning first. So, we want to improve Ali in two aspects. First, as reconstructions from Ali only loosely match the input on a perceptual level, we want to achieve better perceptual matching in the reconstruction. Second, we also want to compress the X using a sequence of composed feature maps. And then it will lead us to a hierarchy of stochastic latent representation. Note that as a consequence of the data top processing inequality, latent representations higher up in the hierarchy cannot contain more information than those situated lower in the hierarchy, which is an interesting feature as higher in the hierarchy have more abstract and high level information and down in the hierarchy uh, contains more fine grained information. Uh, in information theoric term, uh, the conditional entropy uh, of the observation uh, observables um, given a latent variable is now increasing as we go to higher level of the hierarchy. This loss of information can be seen as, um, as something responsible for the perceptual discrepancy observed uh, in Alice reconstructions. So the question that uh, we want to answer with Ali. Um, can be, how can we achieve higher perceptual fidelity of the data reconstructions while also having a compressed latent space that's strongly coupled with the input data? So, reconstruction is a two-step process. An act of compression and abstraction, which is called encoding, and act of description, which is called decoding. Reconstruction error can be understood as a distance between X and X of reconstruction. And the problem is that if we assume the manifold hypothesis, there is no natural metric on the data manifold. In order to be able to reason about your construction error, one had to first specify a metric. In our work, we define a different expected reconstruction error, uh, which will be discussed and compared with uh, variational autoencoder reconstruction error, which is uh, Euclidean distance. In our setting, the variational autoencoder recon uh, reconstruction error corresponds to assuming uh, an isotropic Gaussian decoder. So, Hali also like Ali is a generative model and jointly train a generative and inference model. Hali uses a simple Markovian structure on its hierarchy and provides semantic meaningful reconstruction with different level of fidelity and progressively more abstract features. This uh, will provide more useful representation for downstream tasks. In Hali, both encoders and decoders follow a very simple Markovian structure. This can be interpreted as the generated mechanism of the latent variables, given the data being the inverse of the data generating mechanism, given the latent variable. If Q of X is the true uh, data distribution and P of um, Z of L, um, the prior on the latent variable, typically uh, the prior will be a simple distribution, such as standard Gaussian. And the composition, uh, okay, so now let's consider uh, the encoder actually. The composition of Markov kernels map the data sample X to sample of the latent variable Z of L using Z1 to ZL minus uh, one, which actually help each other to build the encoder. So let's see the decoder. The same of the uh, the same of the encoder uh, decoder um, is the composition of Markovian kernels mapping prior samples of Z of L to data samples X through Z L minus one to Z one, uh, and we call it the decoder. The Markovian character of both the encoder and decoder implies a hierarchy of reconstructions in the decoder. This Markovian structure implies uh, a hierarchy of reconstruction, uh, which means that we have a reconstruction at each, each level of the hierarchy. We can think of the reconstruction of the X at each level as a projection of the data sample X to the intermediate representation and then projecting it back uh, into the data space. Then the reconstruction error for a given input X 
at the else hierarchical level is simply computed by the given formula, uh, which is actually like considering the latent uh, latent space. Uh, having, con having constructed the joint distribution of the encoder and the decoder, we can do match these distributions through adversarial training, and can be uh, we can actually um, show that under an ideal non-parametric discriminator, this is equivalent to minimizing the Jensen channel divergence between the joint distribution of the encoder, which we presented the formula in the previous slide, and the decoder. As shown in the graph, uh, one side, um, we have the data X going through a parameterized deep neural networks uh, into Z1 space, and then it goes to Z2. On the other side, it's the decoder, which is drawn from a fixed prior, and then it goes through another parameterized network and it generates Z1, and then it generates the reconstruction. Now let's check another graph, uh, again representing the Hadi model. As we are actually dealing with images, the intermediate light layers like Z1 uh, itself is convolutional. Uh, and lower in the representation, it also, it's also able to capture more local um, and spatial information. And it, as it goes higher, it learns, um, in, in the hierarchy, it learns more high-level information and more semantic information. So as we've seen so far, uh, both Ali and Hali relies on jointly training an inference and a generative model. Hali leverage um, the hierarchical architecture to offer the construction of the same data sample with increased level of fidelity. So we have also seen the abstraction of the learning representation increases uh, when we go high in the hierarchy. So now let's see the experimental setup. Uh, first, the present reconstruction obtained uh, by employing Halley. This slide is about the reconstruction on the SVHN data set. And it highlights Halley's ability to reconstruct the input sample with high fidelity. In both right and left pictures, the old columns are the original data, and the columns on the right of the original data are the reconstructed images. As you see the reconstruction from Z1, which is the first level of the hierarchy, exhibit just local and fine grained differences with the original natural images. Uh, what the reconstruction from Z2 uh, is able to capture higher level information in the hierarchy and uh, displays global changes. It indeed shows how different level of the hierarchy capture different level of abstractions. Like in this case, if you check the reconstruction of the two and 154 shown by yellow blobs around them from the Z1, um, uh, like if you check the Z1, like uh, the Z1 reconstructed one, uh, very fine grained details of the image is captured. While in Z2, the semantic are captured, like the color of the background of two and 154 have changed, but uh, the number is still the same. So it actually learned more meaningful information in the Z2 and more general and global information. So here's the reconstruction obtained uh, from the C4 data set. Uh, and the same realization can be applied here as well. Like the yellow blob, uh, the car captured from the Z1 uh, give most of the detailed information while the reconstructed images from uh, Z2 capture semantic of the image which here in this case is a car, like um, in the Z2, like the uh, reconstructed image obtained by Z2, you can see like the car color is changed from um, silver, I guess, to red, but this is still a car and the orientation is also preserved. So the same reasoning again can be applied for the ImageNet and for Celeva data set. Here in this um, data set, in um, the image and data set that I put the pictures, uh, the difference uh, between the level of abstraction and the quality of semantic of the changes regarding to the original images uh, are more clear compared to the previous data sets, uh, which were easier data sets. 
Like in Z1, uh, more fine grained details are preserved by um, the information embedded in Z2 can be considered more high level. Uh, for many of the images, shape and color changes in Z2, Z2, but still the nature of the images are preserved. So the object will stay still the same. Like if uh, you check the yellow one, uh, again, yellow blobs, uh, there's a dog um, which like uh, in the reconstructed image from Z1, it still stays exactly the same dog, almost the same little dog. But uh, in the other one, it actually generates another kind of dog, but with the same orientation. Um, with different colors, so it preserved the high-level information, which is actually being done. Uh, so something very interesting, actually, is also um, that in this figure, uh, like uh, we can see that um, uh, by increasing the, uh, in the reconstruction, uh, fidel fidelity is not impacted. Um, it impact the quality of the generated samples from the Halley's decoder. So actually, like what you can see here is that uh, the quality of the images are not decreased. Um, so still, like by even having a good reconstruction, you you can still have like good samples which is generated from Halley. So let's also see the celebrated uh, images, generated images. You see like very high quality images which are generated here, um, despite of having also like a very good reconstruction. So uh, we further investigate the quality of the reconstruction with a quantitative assessment. We train all attributes of the syllable data set individually and try to predict the labels of the attributes for the original data. And the reconstruction images using VAE, Ali, and both level of highly reconstructions. To do so, we apply VGG on images and uh, the reconstructions, basically want to compare them. If you consider reconstruction as being good, if it preserves the attributes, um, which is actually coming from the original samples. We also provided a full table uh, in, our, or in, our, in our actually submitted paper, uh, which is available in Open Review, um, by all individual attributes scores. And here in this table, uh, the mean and the standard deviation over all attributes is presented. This table shows that the proportion of the attributes where Halley's uh, reconstruction all performance the other models uh, and is clearly dominant. So it actually learns like from Z2 it actually learns uh, important information and works uh, even better than um, the original image. Uh, therefore the encoder decoder relationship of Halley better preserve uh, the important information belonging to the different attributes compared to the other models which we also presented here. Following the paper of autoencoding beyond pixels, discriminator provides a rich similarity metric on the manifold of natural images. We leverage the discriminator's feature space in order to compare the reconstruction error on the ImageNet 128 by 128 dataset using two levels of Halley. Um, like in Halley here, we have just like Z, uh, Z1 and Z, Z2. Uh, we see that reconstruction error under the discriminator's feature map uh, decreases steadily during training. Moreover, reconstruction error from the first level of the hierarchy are uniformly bound, bounded above by the reconstruction error of the second level. This is, um, this is very in line with the fact that latent representations in the second level of the hierarchy cannot hold more uh, low-level information about the input um, than those in the first. Mm -hmm. So note that uh, also how the reconstruction error in pixel space is a poor measure of the similarity between the input and its rec reconstruction, as we mentioned before. Using the Euclidean distance in pixel space, the reconstruction error from Z2 starts quickly. And it also like, um, Basically, like it will stay steady uh, during the whole uh, process, and it's basically not showing if it's learning something or not. So now we are trying to assess the quality of our learned representation through the in painting task. In painting is basically filling the blind part of the image uh, by reconstructing the missing part of the image. 
It's a very difficult task since sufficient prior information is needed to meaningfully replace the missing part of the image. While it's common to incorporate in painting a specific training, we just simply use a standard highly adversarial loss. During training and reconstruction, the um, reconstruction of the cropped images during the inference time. We first predict the missing portion from the higher level of reconstructions, followed by iteratively using the lower level reconstructions that are pixel wise close to the original image. We are not actually applying any kind of blending, post processing, or explicit supervision. And the effectiveness of our model at this task is due to the hierarchy. And we can uh, we can extract semantically consistent reconstructions from the higher level of the hierarchy uh, and leverage them with pixel-wise reconstructions from the lower level. And as here you see, um, for the Celeva data sets, uh, the images which are um, actually filled and um, are in painted have really good quality. So we also did it for SPHN data set, which is actually the same. It also have really good quality here and is like making really believable images by feeding them. Uh, as well as the MS Coco data set, which you will see in this data set, like you will see so many like believable images by um, uh, fitting the blank here in like using in painting basically. Um, you will see really nice uh, constructed images. So here we have uh, some interesting ex experiments to measure the quality of our higher level of uh, representation and to show how each layer learns to encode more abstract representation of the data. So on the cellular data set, we individually change the latent variables and observe the effect. We first sample a latent code from the prior distribution Z2, then multiply individual components of the vector by scholars in a fixed range. Let's say uh, here is like minus three to three. For Z1, we fix Z2 and multiply each feature map independently by scholars ranging from like a fixed number to another fixed number. In all cases, these modified latent vectors are then decoded back to the input data space. So if you check picture A and B, uh, show some of uh, those decoding for Z2 and C and D uh, do the same for Z1. The last column contains the decoding obtained from the originally sampled latent codes. The interesting observation is that representation learning the uh, Z2 learn more high-level information and abstract information uh, and variation like gender, while uh, Z, more, uh, Z has the tendency to learn more pixel-wise changes such as saturation or lip color, which is like actually aligned with um, of what we claim. Uh, in this experiment, we show how highly can exploit um, the jointly learned hierarchical inference mechanism to modify actual data samples by manipulating their latent codes. Consider we have a sample X from the data set, um, which is a set of a data set. Encoding X creates Z1 and Z2. Then we modify Z2 by multiplying a specific entry by a scholar like alpha. Let's call it uh, Z2 of alpha. And then we decode the Z2 of alpha um, and to get to the Z1 of alpha. We decode the unmodified encoding vector and get to Z1 again. Then the innovation vector is the subtraction of the original unmodified decode, um, um, decoded vector and the uh, Z1 of alpha. This method actually provides explicit control and allows us to carry out um, these variations on the real samples uh, in a completely unsupervised way, which is really interesting. Here you can uh, see how adding the innovation tensor can help adding or removing some of the attributes. Uh, on the right side, you can see the real cell of a feature, um, like basically face, and the corresponding uh, innovation tensor on the left. Uh, for instance, the, ter uh, the third row in the figure um, features Christiana uh, Hendricks, I hope that uh, I'm pronouncing her name well, uh, followed by hair colored innovation tensor update. Similarly, um, the first two rows presents uh, the usage of a smile innovation tensor, glasses and hair color. So we also have um, an un 
transfer bias classification um, experiment. So the experiment, um, again, is also on syllable data set, and um, it's considering the attributes, uh, which is like 40 attributes on syllable. So we trained 40 linear SVMs on highly encoded representations, thanks to the inference network uh, on our validation set, and then measure performance on the test set. Uh, we report uh, the balance accuracy in order to evaluate the attribute prediction performance. Let's just note that uh, for this experiment, the highly encoder and decoder were trained um, in an entirely unsupervised um, framework. Basically, attributes labels were only used to train the linear SVM part. And it's very interesting that Halley's unsupervised features work better than VAE and Ali on the classification task. But more interestingly is that they're even all performing the best handcrafted features in the state of the art by a wide margin. Halley also all performs a number of supervised and deeply, super, um, deeply supervised features. And uh, the attribute-based results and also like the references of the state of the art approaches uh, shown in the like original paper, uh, which is an open review. So actually we have also some other uh, experiments uh, in or um, uh, with, which is given in, the, um, which is on the paper uh, and uh, you can, I encourage you to actually read the paper in open review and hopefully it's gonna be soon archived. And thank you. And I want to actually also thank my co-authors, like basically Ishmael Belghazi, uh, who is the first author uh, of this work, and also Aaron Corbill, who is the super, my supervisor, uh, who was my supervisor when uh, during my PhD when I was at Mila, uh, and also Sai Rajesh for Olivier Master Pietro and Giovanna. And thanks also, Philippe, for... <laughs> well, thank, thanks a lot, <laughs> yes. So that was a very interesting talk. Uh, we have a number of questions from you here on uh, on the webcast the website. If any of you have any more questions, I'll hesitate to ask them. We have a couple of minutes for the Q&A. Um, so let's start right away looking at the questions. Um, so first question here, and I think it's very interesting for everybody. Negar, when you look at Halley here, um, and maybe like other adversary learn inference uh, systems, what do you think are uh, the applications here? If you put your engineer's hat, I imagine, where would you see uh, yourself using something like that? Oh, that's actually a very interesting question. So if we look actually like a uh, real world, like, okay, so I learned about generative models, how I can, how I am able to actually apply them in real world. Like, um, no, um, basic generating models, basically, again, uh, is applying several different uh, applications, like fashion industry, you can see, like, um, designing clothes with uh, generating models, uh, or, like, imagine that you have, um, in the in painting task that uh, I actually showed you, here, imagine that you have uh, uh, an old picture which has some problems, and this can be also helpful on, uh, like making that, uh, like correcting that images and several applications, which maybe I can't even like think about them now. Um, but uh, th this is actually a really, really applicable topic. And um, yeah, it's interesting to think about this. <clears throat> okay, so there's another question here. But uh, first of all, if you can you go back a couple of slides and show uh, the slide on in painting for. Um, uh, yeah, maybe the Anesco code data set was interesting, right? Yeah. Um, so these are very, uh, very impressive results. The first question I had for you here is the images you painted, were they on the training set? Are these images that the system had seen before or they're totally new? Well, basically, uh, they haven't seen the missed part of that image at all. But like uh, as the input, actually, they are also getting that part, which is like crop part, like uh, the parts which is missing some part. So yeah, they, they will get the image which doesn't have that part at all. Okay. Well, oh no, they haven't. Interesting. And if you compare the unpainted result with the real image, do you get uh, that? You know, Halley's imagination in that case it was close enough to reality because this looks really 
pretty good to me, like most of them. Yeah, actually, yeah, it's interesting. At least like the pizza one, like I would actually think that it looks very like a, a real pizza. If you look at the original pictures, they are also like kind of more or less um, the same actually. Uh, yeah, they're actually like, I mean, in my opinion, it looks really like um, real images, so. Um, yeah, so extending on that, someone asked a question. Uh, this looks pretty good for static images. Do you think we could do something similar for video sequences? Oh, actually, uh, like my main uh, area of interest is like video understanding and videos, basically. So it, it's actually a very interesting question. Yeah, I think like that um, this model or any, like uh, all these models can be applied for video. And indeed, like thinking about this, um, is that uh, for the in-painting task, um, uh, with video, it's it should be kind of easier in my opinion because you have like also temporal information which can help you in smoothing the path, like um, the information. So or you can also like consider it as like uh, like the convolutional three D. You can consider um, as like uh, having the information, getting the information in the three D format, uh, which like not having a long sequence but like three or four slides. Um, and sorry. Uh, I said so much slides, <laughs> and, uh, frames, and uh, like applying it there. Excellent. Yeah, I think it's and, and, and building on that, um, so we see a lot of, uh, of static images. Listening to you, it feels like video would, uh, would be doable too. Do you think uh, similar techniques could be used for text or natural language? Uh, uh, you mean like a hierarchical, a hierarchical representation? Yes. Uh, um, like actually, it's it's a really interesting question. But, but my expertise, my area of expertise, is not uh, on NLP. But uh, generative models were applied uh, also uh, on text, but um, like um, not in a, in a continuous way because um, uh, like you need um, to have like a discrete representation. Uh, so I think it should be interesting to try it for uh, NLP. Although I'm not like uh, a really expert on that. Yeah. Um, okay, so okay, uh, switching gears a little here. I find that all these generative models um, that are, you know, yield very impressive results for us humans. Uh, we didn't think computers could uh, could paint like that. Um, and but you personally, what makes you uh, so interested in uh, understanding the, the task of reconstruction? Basically, um, so. Actually, it, it takes me uh, back to the first slides, uh, which I started with, like saying why reconstruction is like interesting. Basically, um, the task, like uh, we, um, imagine we have input data, we have data which is like natural images, uh, and, and we want to understand about like important information. And in understanding this important information, the, like we want to um, have a representation of this important information. Uh, and using those information, being able to solve some problems. So this reconstruction is actually trying to understand like um, the important part of the, uh, the data. And like with this hierarchical representation, we are learning some like uh, different uh, level of abstraction in um, uh, each, each layer of representation. Cool. And thanks, that's a good question. Yeah, and, and there's another one here that came in uh, just now. It's pretty interesting. In terms of time complexity, what do you think? Uh, how, how would Halley with an H compare to Ali without the H or or to regular GAN? Is this similarly complex or uh, it takes much longer? Uh, well, basically, uh, if uh, you mean like if it's easy to train Halley compared to Ali or GAN, like yeah, the training uh, part. Yeah, the training part is um, no. It, it's yeah. Uh, it also takes time, and yeah, it. Um, yeah. Uh, all these all these models it's, are pretty much. It's basically like one of the uh, thing that we address in the paper is that like we want to actually work on uh, making it stable. And yeah. And so so it has it suffers from the similar issues that GAN yeah, has, exactly. Yeah, okay. yeah. And, and when when uh, so this is for the training part, but for uh, the reconstruction, you know, when you have to do in painting, mm -hmm. is it uh, is it relatively efficient or uh, compared to which method, basically, like um, according to my knowledge, it's um, um, it's more efficient than some of the methods which existed, um, uh, which 
but maybe still look, there are some handcrafted features or methods. Um, I mean, I actually, to be honest, don't yeah, know. Okay. Well, <laughs> this is this is very much research work. So engineers, get get ready to make that fast. This is uh, this would be my closing comments. Um, okay, so the, we're pretty much running out of time here. Um, so thanks a lot again, uh, Negar, for this very informative uh, presentation. Thanks everybody who watched for the really good questions, um, and Negar for uh, for these insightful answers, and a special. Uh, uh, thanks to everybody who took the time to uh, participate and watch this today. Um, so this webinar was recorded, um, you'll be happy to hear, and it will be available online in a few days at webinar, webinar with an A, dot acm.org. And you can find announcements of upcoming webinars and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and acm.org. So also please fill out our quick survey where you can suggest future topics or speakers um, and you should be uh, able to see it on your screen right now. Again, on behalf of the ACM, of uh, Negar Rotamzade, I'm going to get that right someday, and myself, Philippe Boudouin, um, thanks again for joining us, and I hope you will join us again in the future. So this concludes the webinar. Thank you. Thank you.